Entrepreneur on Fire, episode 59. Welcome to EntrepreneurOnFire.com, where remarkable entrepreneurs share their inspiring story. Let their journey illuminate your path to success. And now, your host, John Dumas. Fire Nation, a common theme you hear at Entrepreneur on Fire is listen to your audience. Well, I've been listening, and I am excited to announce the launch of podplatform.com. We have received an incredible amount of feedback from entrepreneurs who want to start their own podcast, but have no idea where to begin. With podcasting, recording your audio is as easy as clicking a red button, but the tough part is what comes after. Think of Pod Platform as a turnkey solution to podcasting. You simply record your audio, send my team your MP3, and we do the rest. It's that simple. Entrepreneur on Fire is generating 100,000 downloads a month in over 100 countries. Think of what that could do for you in your business. Go to www.podplatform.com to find out more. Okay, let's get started. I am simply thrilled to introduce my guest today, Sean Malarkey. Sean, are you prepared to ignite? Yes, I'm prepared to ignite. Sean is the co-founder of Inspired Marketing, which is the number one company that creates digital online trading with a focus on social media. Inspired Marketing was just named to the Impact 100 list, which comprises the top 100 companies in America that are run by young people. This also included an invitation to the White House. I've given Fire Nation a little overview, Sean, but why don't you take it from here and tell us who you are and what you do? Okay, so just several years ago, I was in a real estate, I had a real estate business that um, started to stress me out. I realized, I thought it was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and uh, we had a pretty big real estate company, a brokerage, we bought and sold a lot of properties, we had a lot of home, over 100 homes in our rental portfolio that we owned and leased out, and I thought it was my retirement, I thought it was what I wanted to do forever, and over time, I just started realizing it was not what I want and I had some business partners that over time kind of became more like a boss or bosses if you will and uh, so I just started getting more and more frustrated with that business and I had a lot of friends that were starting to do pretty well uh, using the internet and uh, to generate money or to build a business and um, I realized that they were running their businesses from their laptops and it really intrigued me and so I started kind of paying attention to that. This is about five or six years ago. The, the bug was, or the fire was kind of lit. And we'll stay with the uh, Ignite fire theme, if you will. But the, the fire was kind of lit from within me that I wanted a different lifestyle. I wanted to be location independent. Uh, I basically wanted you know, the life of my dreams. I want to be able to do what I wanted when I wanted. And I felt like in that business that I was in, uh, that I just didn't have that ability and the final moment, the defining moment came when I asked time to go to my wife's uh, country of Argentina for vacation and we had allotted ourselves a set number of weeks per year for vacation I was going to use them all in that uh, time frame and my business partners, we got in a giant argument that uh, I was not able to go for that long of a period of time and it just really frustrated me um, because I felt like I had lost control of my life I had lost control. I lost the ability to do what I wanted when I wanted. And um, so some time passed. I sold my interest in that business to my business partners and moved on. And I knew real estate really well. And providing information to people, it creates a shortcut that either saves them time, saves them money, or helps them earn more money is obviously a very lucrative thing. Uh, Much like the podcast you have here, it uh, probably gives people some great insight into becoming an entrepreneur and then also inspires them. So I wanted to get into that space and um, one of the big things when I was in my real estate company, I I did all of the marketing for the company and I started noticing social media becoming more and more prevalent um, in web usage. This is about five years ago. And, uh, and then the marketing component started be, you know, waking up or becoming alive, if you will, uh, for social media. So I started using it for the real estate business, got out of real estate, thought I would get into teaching and educating on real estate. And um, social media just kind of happened by accident. I became fascinated with Twitter 
and the results I was getting from Twitter. And in my first three months of using Twitter, I just got massive traction, started growing a huge following. I think I grew up to 70, my first three months I had over 70,000 followers on Twitter. And um, one of the big reasons for that was I started a blog, which is kind of almost like a diary back then, if you will, where I started documenting you know, all the things I was doing every day on Twitter that were helping me grow and helping me get engagement and helping me drive traffic and sharing that with people and, and sharing my lessons, the things I was learning and uh, good resources. And every day I would post. And I think by the end of the first 30 days of starting that new website, I had over a thousand unique visits a day coming to it. And as a website owner, John, you can appreciate that, um, you know, getting that kind of traffic and kind of traction. Huge. Yeah. And so just a few months after I was into it, I, I got a co-working office space. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's just a giant office space where you essentially rent a desk. And uh, I found this little incubator, a startup incubator in Columbus, Ohio, that was a co-working space with a bunch of great entrepreneurs and companies doing great things. And I ended up meeting my business partner uh, who was doing some great things with LinkedIn. And I said, hey, you know, we're, you're doing great things with LinkedIn, I'm doing great things with, with Twitter, uh, we should combine our efforts and um, together we'll have a larger audience reach and we'll be able to offer our audience more. And uh, that was kind of the beginning, the beginning of uh, what is now Inspired Marketing, which was, like you said earlier, just named as one of the top 100 companies in America. So that was about three years ago, actually three years ago in, in, uh, as of August. So we've gone from, <clears throat> we, we left the co-working space, moved into my basement, and, um, and worked from there for a while. Now uh, we're completely location independent. I'm now living out in Santa Barbara. Um, you know, running, running the business from here. My business partner's down in LA. Well, listen, Sean, let's transition now to our first real topic, which is our success quote, because at Entrepreneur on Fire, we really like to get the motivational ball rolling for this awesome content that you have coming up for us with a success quote. What do you have? This is a great one that I just found recently, and it states, shallow men believe in luck, strong men believe in cause and effect. And that's a great quote from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So, Sean, how do you apply that to your mentality, way of thinking, your business? You know, it's interesting. I feel like a lot of people believe in luck and oftentimes kind of sit back and wait for luck to happen, if you will. And um, I believe, you know, there are some people, sure, you can say they got lucky, they were in the right place at the right time or whatever. But even then, it relates back to the cause and effect portion of that. They had an idea and they, ex they took, action, took action and they executed. And that is cause and effect, if you will. And uh, had they not taken that action, that luck would have never happened to them. So, Sean, I love that. And let's use that to transition now to our next topic. You've already been very open with us and shared, I don't want to really call it a failure, but just a decision you made in the past as part of your entrepreneurial journey when you decided you wanted to break away and become location independent, and you were very intrigued with working from a laptop or just online in general. Can you take us back, not quite as far as all the way back to your real estate days, but sometime more recently, when you encountered a failure or you had an obstacle that you had to overcome that you can share with Fire Nation? Ooh, that's a good one, man. I um, We had a, a product launch. We do product launches several times, which are just short windows of time or promotional periods where we uh, get a lot of attraction or a lot of attention. We just, it's like a giant sale, if you will. And as part of that giant sale or launch period, we do a lot of work leading up to it to make sure everything's ready to go and good to go. And then there's a lot of marketing and, and things that go on uh, to get a lot of traction to the event, if that makes sense. And uh, two weeks before the promotional launch, my business partner, he's an avid team handball player, plays club team handball. He actually made the U.S. national team and uh, was asked to play in Argentina for the Pan Am Games. And this was going to go down during the actual launch. And I really, I just thought we could do it, thought we could pull it off without his help and without his input. And in hindsight, it probably cost us 300000 in the minimum, over half a million dollars in revenue uh, by not having his involvement. And he, he fulfills a very important role during those. 
Uh, he's a great networker and he's able to get a lot of people to do, people to do a lot of things. He's not, I don't even want to say persuasive because he's not persuasive. Just people uh, resonate well with him and they enjoy, you know, when he reaches out and asks for something, almost always people oblige. And I thought that we could do it. And um, in hindsight, I wish we had delayed the launch three weeks in order to give him time to go and play team handball, which it wouldn't have mattered for us from a business perspective that much at all. Uh, it would have been much wiser in the end, and as a result, I think we would have we would have probably uh, generated several hundred thousand more dollars in revenue had I had him here and, and uh, you know doing the role that he does best during that product launch. That's a great example, and I love how specific you were because that just really makes it come alive for the listeners. So thank you for sharing that. Can you just pull out like a specific but kind of an abstract lesson that you learned from that that you can apply to business in general? Sure. So this is, I mean, I think key to any business. Um, we rely a lot on partners to help drive traffic to uh, our products and our information. And that's what he's really good at. He builds great relationships. Uh, he's one of the best networkers, if not the best networker I've ever met. He's very calculated and very authentic and very real in the way he goes about it. So uh, for anybody who's launching a product or a business, uh, if you have others, you know, if, if you are dependent upon others, um, that early success is key because it shows social proof. And what we normally do and we didn't do in this scenario is we get some of our top partners to get on board in the first few days of the, of the promotion. And when that happens, other partners will see that and go, okay, well, if he's, you know, working with them, I'll work with them. If, um, if, you know, and the other thing is too, in our messaging back to them, we would we would email all of our partners on a daily basis. I think people there's a real transparency people can see through uh, in that messaging. And if things are going great and very successful, they're more inclined to get on board because people gravitate towards success. And because they weren't going as well as they had in the past, uh, I think our communication may have reflected that. And I think it probably cost us a lot of, of money because people could see. No matter how, how hard I tried to fake it, the things were going great. And they were going good. They weren't, they were, they were bad by any means. I can't be disappointed. But in the past, when we've set up these promotional periods and had you know, a lot of our key influencers involved early, uh, it just showed a level of social proof and excitement that is hard to fake, if you will, and um, ended up bringing on kind of the masses, if you will, when the influencers were on early. So in hindsight, we learned you know, a valuable lesson there that it's key to, uh, you know, Keep your influencers involved, or get your influencers involved early, and get the success going strong early. Uh, and as a result, I think in all of our messaging back to everybody who was so vital in helping us, uh, it becomes clear that things are going well, and they gravitate towards success and want to be involved. That is a great, great lesson learned. Get that motivational ball rolling and just keep it going. So we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum now, Sean, because you shared with us this great challenge that you face and the lessons you learned from it. And you've actually already shared with us some aha moments that you've had because you launched your website back when you were really in with Twitter and you were getting over 1,000 unique followers visiting your site because you were having these aha moments with Twitter and then they were loving and reading these aha moments and coming back for more. So you were always having these little light bulbs that were going off. Can you go back in your entrepreneurial journey and share with us one great light bulb that went on when just the clouds parted and the sun just shined through and you said, wow, this is something special. This is an aha moment that I can knock out of the park. For us, it was, it was defining, I guess, our mission and our purpose. Um, when we started, we had a lot of uh, um, high-end products, if you will. We, we knew the knowledge and the information that we had to share was very valuable and worth a lot. And so we charged a premium for that. And um, as a result, it was, I don't want to say a constant hustle, but it felt like in order to keep landing high-end clients, uh, we were always kind of hustling, if you will. And we made a shift in our business about almost a year, a little bit more than a year and a half ago, uh, to focus on the other end of the spectrum. Um, and that was not the low end, if you will, but the lower end of, of training prices, if you will, uh, for our type of product. And um, when we did that, you know, our original thought was that a lot of people can't afford the high end prices. A lot of our audience, the majority, can. 
So if we lower prices and the majority can't afford it, are we going to be better off? And what it ended up creating was a much more sustainable long-term business because when we made the price incredibly affordable, our goal was to maintain or improve upon the same level of quality for what we were offering for the high-end stuff, but sell it at a low, low price to kind of own the market, if you will. And the results kind of spoke for themselves. Uh, traditionally in the past, when we would do the kind of the launches, the promotional periods, uh, we would do a lot of sales in a two-week window, and then they would literally almost just drop off. And uh, what ended up happening, which shocked us, it was all kind of by accident, but um, <clears throat> what shocked us was when we were done with it, that the sales just continued to come. They kept coming, they kept coming to the point that, you know, if we were selling during the promotional period 40 units a day, 50 units a day, 100 units a day, whatever the number may be, within a week or two of it ending, we would literally drop to zero or one a day at the most or a couple a week at the most. And uh, when we shifted to that low end, lower end model, uh, we saw sales continue at 10 to 20 a day um, forever, I mean essentially forever. And what we ended up finding out was happening was um, we, because of that price point, a lot of people were looking for solutions for their audience to re recommend or refer them to. And then also the referrals from current customers shot through the roof. Uh, you know, they would get these trainings, go through them, get amazing results. So it was really easy when they were having conversation with their friends, you know, whether they be business associates or whatever. Um, it was very, very easy for them to say, oh my gosh, if you need help with, you know, Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever network they were talking about or online marketing, you know, you should check this out. And so the word of mouth just kind of went viral. And um, I like, I mean, I like to think we, we literally create, last year we served, I think, somewhere around 20 or 25,000 customers. I don't even know the exact number. Um, and probably a third of those customers were referral business from existing customers. Wow. Now, an aha moment that I'm pulling out of this, Sean, and correct me if I'm wrong, exceed the expectations. You guys were exceeding people's expectations on every level by having these incredibly high quality products for an affordable price. Is that something that you attribute to this viralness that happens? Absolutely, absolutely. And the um, you know, it's not even it's just the fact that they're high quality. We also took a big focus on simplicity. And uh, I don't know if you've ever read the Steve Jobs bio, but it really reaffirmed and kind of cemented some new ideas along those lines. His idea, you know, with a lot of the Apple products was just to make them as simple as possible, so that when people got them, they in in inherently or intuitively knew exactly what to do, where to go, where to start, where to get over. So all of our trainings, when you log in, uh, you know, we made them really simple to start with. And then I read the Steve Jobs book and it just hammered home the importance of that. So I went back and just looked at our members areas for these trainings and I said, you know, what can I take out that is not absolutely necessary? You know, maybe only 2% of the people here are clicking on this link. And, uh, you know, is that benefiting the majority? if we have this here, because in my opinion, when you're looking at a training, you know, and you're, you're there, you bought something and you want to digest it, the more kind of bells and whistles oftentimes can distract you from the main or the core purpose, which is the actual content in the training. So I started looking at the analytics for our sites and seeing what people were clicking and what they were digesting, uh, where they were starting and everything. And I literally went back and removed probably 70% of the options on our website uh, for the members areas. And as a result, we saw time on the website more than triple. And, and this spoke, spoke, I mean, this is as good as it gets. Our refund rates uh, were cut in half within 60 days of making those changes. And what I can attribute that to is by taking out all of these extra things that we thought we were adding more value by having them, um, it just attracted from the core purpose. So the quicker I can get people to take action and start the training, the more excited they get, the more training they're going to go through, and as a result, the more value and the more benefit they're going to get from it. So we literally went through and stripped out everything that was not adding massive value, and as a result, it created more value for our members on the core purpose of the training, and uh, as a result, it was easier for them to get into it, digest it, and uh, get more out of it. I love that. And just to go back to your Steve Jobs comment, I still take my iPhone and I 
turn it over a couple times and I'm like, wow, there really is only one button on this thing. <laughs> I mean, talk about simple. It, it's amazing, isn't it? I, there's a good story about, I don't remember if it was in the Steve Jobs bio or I read it on a blog, but there was a guy who was in um, somewhere in Africa or a third world country, because I don't remember if it was Africa, but a third world country doing a, a mission and he had taken along his iPad and he was blown away that he handed it to a six-year-old and uh, the six-year-old kid who had never seen an electronic device in his life opened the iPad up and just started navigating around using it with no instruction. And he couldn't speak the language, so he couldn't instruct him how to use it. And he was blown away. And I thought, you know what? If our members' areas and our, our products can become that simple, that people don't need to be told where to go, what to do, it just slaps them in the face, this is what you need to do, how you get started, and uh, get them digesting the content. It's, it's a big struggle. I don't know if you realize this or not, but there's a study that Borders or Barnes & Nobles put out several years ago that said 90% of people that buy books never read past the first chapter. And in, in our, tr our products, which are our trainings, are a lot like that, if you will. People get excited and they buy it, and uh, they may not even, you know, they may get into the first lesson or the first thing and then not go back. So my goal with our trainings is just to get people to consume it as fast as possible when that energy level and the excitement is highest, which is right at the point of purchase. And I know if they do that, you know, if I can get them into it and get them started right away, they will get, they'll become more excited. They will then therefore dedicate more time, you know, dive into it deeper. And uh, the more value they get, the happier they are with their purchase and the more results they get. I love that. Sean, let's move now into your current business. You're rolling along. You've got a lot of things going on. Your move is complete. You're location independent. Things are great. What's one thing that's really exciting you about your business right now? Man, being here in Santa Barbara has really uh, made me appreciate life on a whole other level, I guess. And having the ability to do what I want when I want uh, as a result of the type of business that I've built uh, is the number one thing. I mean, every, there isn't a day that goes by. I'm a, the simple things excite me. I mean, a sunset, the stars, clouds in the sky, if they look a certain way, you know, I just, I get fascinated with simple things. And here, being here has uh, taken that kind of appreciation, if you will, to a whole new level. And, uh, and I just feel grateful every day that I've created a lifestyle that, A, I could, I could up and move my family across the country. I lived in Columbus, Ohio before. Uh, to be here and uh, and then be that I have you know the ability really to do what I want when I want I've designed my business my lifestyle that way this is kind of odd John but I don't keep a calendar I really don't keep a calendar um, this interview this week is literally the only thing on my calendar for the whole week I love that yeah and I do that and t I, I, don't, I can't ever decide if it's irresponsible if it's immature I, I really don't know but uh, for me, lifestyle is number one, and being able to do what I want when I want uh, is the is the highest priority. So, I get so many people that want to set up phone calls. It's not necessarily, like interviews are very important, and the you know, oftentimes there's you know several people involved in the uh, in the interview. Somebody you're recording the audio and whatever. So I know it's important. So I set times for those. Um, but phone calls. I have business associates that want to talk about different things in business, and and they'll email me and say, "What are a couple of good times you can talk?" And I just hit reply with my cell phone number and I say, call me anytime. If I can pick up and talk, I will. If not, leave me a message and I'll call you back that day. And um, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. I, I may move, move towards a calendar. My business partner has a, we share our Google calendar so we can see what each other's up to so we don't over schedule something over the same time. He has multiple things on his every day. But for me, uh, again, I mean, it just goes back to the, the lifestyle piece of it and the importance of that. And as a result, I literally don't keep a calendar. Sean, that's, that's liberating. It really is. I love it. What is your vision for the future of Sean Malarkey? I want to provide, I, I know that through providing value, uh, I will prosper, if you will. And a couple of years, like a couple, couple years ago, a couple months ago, someone offered, I'm just going to get a long way about this, but I'll get back to it. Uh, back in December, someone offered to buy our company and we got a, a price and it was a good price and a good offer, and the more we thought about it, we thought we'd be silly to sell it now because the company's growing, growing pretty fast. We, we've been doubling and tripling annual revenues for a couple of years now. So I thought, why would we sell it now when you know it's going to grow to a much higher level at that point we could sell it? So, but it really got me excited about the idea of selling a business. And one of the big things, our business uh, is a lot of it's focused around 
uh, us, if you will. We're kind of the centerpiece of it. So I asked myself, is this a sellable business that I've got now? And um, it's been interesting to see, you know, I've had several friends in the last few years that have, have built up companies and sold them for anywhere from, you know, a couple million dollars to one just recently sold his company for $220 million. And um, to me, that represents the ultimate freedom, if you will. You know, can you imagine a payday of a couple hundred million? And uh, not I mean, yet. <laughs> not yet. And I honestly could not imagine that a year ago, maybe even two years ago. But now I know it's possible uh, through that person, you know, reaching out to buy our company. I got in conversations with several business brokers and attorneys who handle either raising funds for businesses or selling of businesses and um, learned a lot about that aspect of it and got some great advice. Uh, you know, mainly that advice was to build a company that was focused around a brand and not a personality. And, uh, and there's certain metrics involved that make a company very marketable to be sold uh, very well. And I realized at that point, we created a giant platform through our current audience that we have, that we have a, a big leg up over the average person. Uh, it's taken us three years to get here, so the average person can easily do it. You could probably do it in half the time if you knew what I knew now. But um, we have a big leg up over the average person to launch and build a company and we're in a space and in a platform that I think we have the ability to to build a ten to a hundred million dollar company in the next couple of years pretty easy. So that is my focus right now, and um, we're working on continuing to grow the business and build the business. We've really just been putting a lot more systems in place, so it's less labor intensive, if you will, uh, so that we can focus our energy on that ten to a couple hundred million dollar idea and uh, go from there. So we've got a couple different ideas that we're working on simultaneously that we'll be growing and uh, building out and uh, if we can create that sellable company for me you know getting a big payday like that represents a lifetime of freedom if you will uh, right now I'm, I'm afforded a freedom that you know could last me for a couple of years if things change in our business something may change and it may go away but uh, being able to sell a company for that kind of revenue represents freedom for the rest of my life if you will and uh, gives me the ability to focus on adding more value back to the world in different ways because I'm not focused on you know earning earning an income if you will anymore it's more what can I do to give back so that is what I think the next couple of years represent for me and uh, what I hope to achieve in that time frame and and I really believe now that I can do it and I know that uh, through belief all things are possible and it once you kind of have that belief uh, it's a lot easier to make it a reality, and I and I feel like I'm there. So we're in the beginning stages of that uh, that process, if you will. Awesome. Well, that's a great vision, Sean, and I really am looking forward to following your journey. And I have no doubt that that will come to fruition. Oh, I appreciate that. So listen, we've now reached my favorite part of the show. We're about to enter the lightning round, and this is where I provide you with a series of questions, and you come back with amazing and mind blowing answers. Does that sound like a plan? I'm going to come back, yes, with some fiery audience, <laughs> to ignite your audience into excitement. All right. In one sentence, what was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming an entrepreneur? Can I make it one word? Yes. Myself. What is the best business advice that you ever received? Take action. Hands down take action and make it happen. There's so many people that spend time uh, getting caught up in analysis paralysis. And I look back at some of our biggest revenue generators right now, things that bring us half a million to a million dollars a year. And when we started, they were awful. They were horrible. But it, it was enough that we just took action and got started. And with that, um, you know, we saw some really success, which excited us to keep going. And had I thought through all the details, you know, to get them to a level where they are now, I would have never gotten started because I would have gotten stuck thinking through everything. Mm, that is exciting advice. What's something that's working for you or your business right now? Uh, transparency. I think just being transparent with our audience and uh, with the folks that support us on a day-to-day -day basis and you know, put food in, in my mouth and my kid's mouth and fries and everything. Being honest, open, and transparent and you know, with me being in the social marketing space, obviously I've got large followings uh, in social media. So 
uh, gives me a platform to just be me and be transparent, admit when I make mistakes, um, share great things that are happening, and I think people relate to that and it can resonate with them. So uh, that's been working tremendously well. Well, thank you for being extremely transparent with Fire Nation today. For sure. So, Sean, do you have an internet resource that you are just in love with, like an Evernote, that you can share with our listeners? Honestly, uh, I had this conversation on Twitter yesterday with somebody about managing teams and tasks. And I'm, this is going to sound really stupid and cliche, but I'm in love with Google. Um, you've probably figured out by now that I kind of like things simple. So Evernote, while I like it, and I think it's a great resource, and a lot of people I can understand why they get value out of it. For me, it's just another service that I have to log into. I use Gmail. Uh, we probably have 5,000 documents now in our Gmail docs folder that our, our company works on. Uh, we do team management, task management, to-do lists, project management, all through Google Docs. We have all of our accounting files are in Google Docs, so I can meet with my accountant on the phone. We can look at docs together and go through them. Uh, I mean, Google is just a, an amazing resource to have, not only through email, through chat. We use Google Hangouts to do work meetings. If you go to my Google Plus stream, you'll see Lewis and I having uh, constant Hangouts because we it's just like Skype, but it's just really easy because we're already logged into email. So I think keeping things simple and keeping it all in one place, uh, there's a big key to that, if you will. You know, one less place I have to remember a password and log into. Um, just makes it that much simpler. So Google for me and using all the tools, a lot of the tools that Google uh, provides you for free has been huge for us. No, you know, and it does not sound cliche and you are in good company, Sean, because I would tell you by far the biggest answer to this question, not even a close second, would be Google and all of Google's products like Docs, like Calendar, everything along those lines. Are people have said that as well? Oh, uh, the I would say... Probably 20% of people answer this way, and there's probably not another answer that's over 2 or 3%. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, there's all these cool little gadgets and tools out there, but I, I swear there's something to be said about simplicity. And, I mean, do you have a Gmail account? I run Entrepreneur on Fire completely off Google Apps. Everything is run off of Google. It's Yeah, I mean, if you start digging around and looking at all the different things, it's, it's unbelievable. Did you know that the email, they have a uh, undo feature for sending emails? Yep, that saved my life a couple times, Sean. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it not even saved my life, it's made my life a lot easier because as I hit send, I, I forget that I forgot, I realized I forgot to CC somebody in the email that was important to. So I just hit the undo button, go back, and, and if anybody's interested, it's in the settings tab or in the labs tab. Um, inside Google. And do you know that if you write anywhere in the email, I have attached such and such and such and such, and then you click send and you haven't attached anything, Google will say, you said you attached something, but you didn't. Do you but want you to? Yes, I love that feature. Oh, that I mean, that literally saves me. It's almost embarrassing how many times a day because I'm sending so many attachments and I'm like, I'm really never getting this right, but I'm almost relying on Google just to remind me every single time. So, Sean... What's the best business book that you've read? The, the best book I could rec I'll, I'll give you two answers to that and I'll explain why. The best book I could recommend to an entrepreneur um, who's listening to this, regardless of business, is a great book by Jim Rohn. Have you heard of Jim Rohn? I love him, sports guy. Yeah, no, not the sports guy. He's a motivational. <laughs> okay, you're, yeah, not that guy. Yeah, he actually recently passed away, which is very sad. I know. I'm a big fan of um, soccer, so I hate the sports guy because he hates soccer. So anyway, uh, you are you were joking about that, but I get it. And Jim did just pass away, but he wrote, I think, the great one of the greatest books ever, and it's called Leading an Inspired Life. If you have not read that book and you're listening to this call, uh, you owe it to yourself and everybody who is around you to go get that book. It, is, it will make you want to become the greatest person you can become. It's Amazing book. I mean, there's very few books I think that have been haven't been able to put down that have left me, you know, ten times greater than I was prior to reading it. So that book will be it should be the first book you read. I think as an entrepreneur because it will uh, inspire you to be amazing. And um, for me personally, I think that the best book for business I've read was the Steve Jobs book. Understanding the type of person he was in his thought process that went into creating the world's most valuable company. 
So Sean, this last question is my favorite, but it's kind of a tricky one. So take your time, digest it before you come back with an answer. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you still had all of the experience, money, and knowledge that you currently have right now, but everything about your business had completely disappeared, leaving you with a clean slate, which many of our listeners find themselves with right now, what would you do? Man, it's a tough question. So when you say that, first and foremost, my family comes to mind. And I've created a pretty good lifestyle for us. So I would need to meet their basic goals and needs and ideally maintain what we have now. So I would probably in some capacity, because of the uh, knowledge base I guess I have, could get into consulting very easily and I could probably pick up the phone and make 20 phone calls and generate the kind of revenue I would need to sustain. Um, so I'd probably get into consulting, but honestly, I think I would just start back over doing what I'm doing if I had to, because if that was an option, I can't remember if it was or not, but I truly love what I do. I, I see people on Facebook all the time saying, thank God it's Friday, and I just feel sorry for them because I get frustrated when it's 5 o'clock on Friday and that I have to shut down. And I know it's a necessity, and I and I... And I value time with my family and and uh, you know rest and relaxation time. But Mondays for me are almost my favorite days every week because I get to get back to work and I get back to doing what I love doing. And I'm fascinated with the business that we have now and the things that we do, the impact we can have, uh, the results that come from our, our audience and the, and all of that feedback. So I I would just probably start right back over where I was because I love doing what I'm doing now inspiring advice, Sean. And you've given us some great actionable advice this entire interview, and we are all better for it. Give Fire Nation one parting piece of guidance, then give yourself a plug, and then we'll say goodbye. I'm, I'm very grateful to be on this call and that you asked me to do it. It's always in the, it's always, I don't want to say surprising, but it's whenever I get asked to do interviews, I'm always like, I'm just honored. So I'm grateful to be here. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Sean. No, I really appreciate it. I mean that. So as far as advice goes, I, I can't say this enough. Um, in fact, I was with a friend this weekend who was talking about he has great ideas, but he finds himself analyzing them too much and not getting started. Uh, some of the most successful people I know, and myself and our business personally, our greatest successes have not come from having the perfect plan. They've come from execution and taking action. So no matter what ideas you have or what business you have, just get started today. Just do something. Find one aspect of it that inspires you and will you know make you take that leap to figure it out to get started and get started right away. And I think you'll find that if your idea is good enough or your business idea or your business is good enough, that initial excitement, uh, no matter how good of a bad job you do creating it and building it, but that initial excitement and the reaction that you get, whether it be through revenue or through whatever you know goals you have with your business, will be enough to keep you going and really inspire you to keep going much further. Uh, I mean, we literally have done massive planning on projects that have never seen the light of day. And I oftentimes think back, well, had we just started with that first idea and rolled with it, uh, this could have been a big company by now, but we didn't. So uh, in our business, everything was all about taking action. We don't like to plan huge projects and too much. Uh, oftentimes we'll start a project and get it rolling, but then we'll go back and say, these are all the steps that need to be done and that's fine. But don't get caught in the analysis paralysis. Just take action. Take action and do something. And, and you, it's like the stupid Nike slogan, just do it. I can't agree with it enough. I mean, when you actually take action and do something, it's the whole cause and effect thing. Going back to that quote, you will see results. And uh, those results will either tell you, okay, it wasn't a great idea or this was an amazing idea. Um, let's roll with it and they'll inspire you to do more. So Taking action, I mean, it's like kind of a cliche thing that we see a lot, you know, but uh, I really believe that that is where the gold is, just taking action and making it happen. Awesome. Now, give yourself a plug. All right. If you want, to, <laughs> this is the part I always say, and I consider myself fairly humble, but uh, you can connect with me on Twitter or on Facebook as well. And uh, if you connect with me on Facebook, I've hit my friend limit, but just tell me you heard me on the show in the message and I'll be glad to accept it because obviously you know me more than just somebody strolling along. So I'd, be, I'd like to connect with people like that. Um, Twitter is a great place to find me as well. There's no connecting there. You just follow me and shoot me a tweet and um, let me know you heard the call. And, um, or you can visit my website, which is seanmalarkey.com and uh, read some of the stuff that I put out there. 
Awesome, Sean. Thank you so much again for just your valuable insight and the time that you took to spend today with Fire Nation. We appreciate it. We salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Awesome. Again, it was an honor to be on. Thanks for having me. Fire Nation, thank you so much for joining us today. Are you interested in learning five ways to make $500 this month? How about five productivity tips that will help you today? Well, that and more is my free gift to you when you go to eofire.com and subscribe to Fire Nation. Lastly, for that entrepreneur ready to take it to the next level, visit ignitemastermind.com, join our elite mastermind community, and watch your business or business idea explode. Thank you for joining us at entrepreneuronfire.com, your daily dose of inspiration. Prepare to ignite.